Hey guys, C is well known for not having a good standard library or basic features that regular programs need. Even basic things like dynamic arrays are just not included in this language. You may be wondering how the hell one can use C without going completely insane. Well, in this video I want to outline a few tips for programming in C. Number 1. Using linear allocators. Since C is a language where we have to do memory management manually, we need to find some mechanism for this. C provides us with the malloc and free functions in the standard library, but we can do better. For one, malloc and free is an allocator which has to account for allocation and deallocation at any point in time. That is, it's highly general. That might seem like a good thing. However, for our use case, specificity can be quite beneficial. How so, you may ask? Well, let me introduce you to this bad boy right here. It's called the linear allocator, or the arena allocator, or the bump allocator. Everyone seems to have a different name for them. I've linked some fantastic articles about arenas in the description, but here's the gist of it. Basically, it consists of a block of backing memory and a pointer called the alloc position, which points to the beginning of the memory. The obvious first question is, how does this allocator actually allocate? Well, you can ask for some sized memory like malloc. What this arena will do for you is return you the current alloc position and then move the alloc position pointer ahead by whatever size you asked. Now you have a sized memory block that you can do anything with, just like malloc. What's the catch here then? Well, you can't free memory allocated with this arena. If you want to free, you have to free the entire backing memory block, but you can't free individual memory allocations. Yikes, this seems like a pretty terrible allocator. But hold your horses, there's a reason why I'm explaining all this. The fact that you can't free individual allocations is enforcing something quite good. It is the definition of a lifetime. Basically, when you allocate some data into some arena, you're saying that this allocation will live as long as the arena does. Now, if you have a new arena, per new lifetime, we have a way of properly using these arenas everywhere. Let's take an example. We're using a library here that wants access to three separate integers at all times until we call done with using library. With the malloc API, we malloc each of these separately and store them as pointers. Then, when we are done using them, we can free them separately. Here's how things change with the arena API. We use arena alloc instead of malloc on each of them separately and free only the entire arena at the end. By itself, this doesn't seem too useful, right? Big whoop, we just condense multiple frees into one. But this is doing more than just that. Imagine the initialization and freeing are in two separate functions. This type of pattern is common while working in C, so what happens now? Well, with the malloc and free API, we need to necessarily store these pointers somewhere, even though we are not using them. So we need to pass in some state and manage it. Yikes, this, this looks weird. Let's try it with the arena. Since we are never using A, B, and C pointers ourselves, we never have to store them in our state. This is a big win. We are also 100% sure that the allocations we make are right next to each other. Hence, cache efficiency is also being achieved. Another nice thing in my opinion is that we can tell which functions are going to be making allocations just from checking whether the function takes in an arena or not. Here's a slightly more complicated example of using these arenas. It's not actually complicated, it just demonstrates how arenas work with each other. First of all, this is a lot of code, but the main thing I want to show in this example is how arenas work together. This function is one that I use to fix file paths, that is, reduce them to their simplest form. For example, it will remove any slash dot slash patterns and it will 
check for dot dot slash patterns and get rid of one folder name before the last slash and other things like that. What we want to do here is manipulate our incoming string, but we don't want to pollute the user given arena with our intermediate nonsense string parts. So instead of allocating everything in the arena given to us, we can initialize a small scratch arena for quick use in this current scope. If you see, the fixed string is getting built up more and more in the scratch arena, and then only the final finished string is pushed onto the main arena where the user expects it to be. Now I think is the appropriate time to talk about strings. In C, strings are represented as a pointer to the first character, that is just a cha cha. But how can C know where the string ends? Well, at the end of the string is a special character called the null terminator. If you are defining a string with double quotes, you don't have to specify this. C will add this character at the end for you. This isn't a particularly good thing for a few reasons. Let's take an example. We have a file name stored somewhere in memory that looks like this. Let's say we just want a string that is the extension of this file name. Well, we can initialize a new pointer which should point to the first t in txt. And we can actually reuse the backslash zero character for both the full name and the extension name. But now what happens if we want only the file name without the extension? Well, it's all pain and suffering. We can initialize a character pointer pointing to the first character again, but we don't have the convenient backslash zero there to stop us from going into the .txt. Well, someone can say, hey, just convert the dot to a null terminator. But this is a big problem. Now if you try to print our original string, we will have messed up. We actually edited the memory to make the string terminate sooner, which is not good. What we have to do here is create an entirely new allocation for just the file name string. Or do we? Well, we can entirely stop this from happening if we give up on null terminated strings and instead use count based strings. So we can define this structure with a character pointer for the string and a u64 for the size. Now look at how simple everything has become. We don't need this extra allocation at all. The string struct I showed before is basically combining the std string and std string view into one. The only problem with the string struct is that we can't tell at a glance whether the string has actually been allocated or is just a view, which is important for possibly needing to free the memory. Well, if you've watched the first part of the video, uh, you'll know that this actually isn't a problem. In fact, who the hell cares whether a string is allocated or is just a view? The arena in which the string is allocated won't care about this and will free the memory anyways. What this allows us to do is use the allocated strings and the view strings in the same functions like stroke and cat, replace all, and so on. Another benefit of kind based strings over null terminated strings is that getting their size is trivial. For null terminated strings, you have to loop through the characters from start one by one until you hit the null terminator. Instead, with the count based string, the size is right there stored within the string struct, quick to use. Well, this addresses two main points people find with using C, but there's another one data structures. The C standard library doesn't give you dynamic arrays, stacks, linked lists, hash tables, and other common data structures. C doesn't have simple templates at all either. So how do we get around this problem? Well, we have access to the preprocessor, so let's use it. We can define macros that act as templates. Basically, we can define a macro for the code that goes in the header files, like struct definitions and function prototypes, and a different macro for the code that goes into the implementation C files. For example, here's a simple template translation of a slice structure, which is basically just a pointer plus length pair. This is the prototype, and here is the corresponding implementation. Now we can expose some common interface for all slices in the form of some more macros. If you look closely, 
these macros take in type arguments, which is precisely what most common templates want. The only problem with this approach is fixing the errors you make. If your program seg faults within a macro implementation, then you have a long-winded process to go through. Basically, your debugger doesn't have the actual tokens corresponding to the seg fault, so it'll break at the macro call. What you'll have to do during testing is expand the macro using the dash e or slash p flag and replace your impo macro with whatever is generated. Then you can run it to the debugger and see exactly where the seg fault happened and try to fix the error. Once you have thoroughly tested the implementation, you can just go back to using the impo macro. Since this is just a write once used forever thing, this is not a bad trade-off. I've tried. There is another way of doing code instantiation, although it is a lot more work. You can use metaprogramming. Basically, you can generate code from some meta file before compiling your main program. A great article about this approach is in the description. For example, I was able to write a table generator meta program based on this article, which I used to instantiate a whole bunch of stacks for UI styles. To be fair, I don't think this is an alternative to macro-based data structures, but I do think it is pretty useful for instantiating code of high density. The things that I talked up till now in this video, except data structures, are all about replacements for the things that are in the C standard library. So next, I just want to say not using the C standard library is completely okay. If you're like me, coming from higher level languages, you're probably used to a big pre-existing standard library. Well, C isn't like this. It's more of a DIY language, because you will need to write most of the stuff that you want. So don't be scared of reinventing the wheel, so to speak, in certain places. That brings us to the end of this video. All of the things I talked about right now are actually implemented in a base layer series made by Mr. Ford Programming. I highly recommend you check it out. Link is in the description. I truly hope you learned something new in this video. That being said, thanks for watching. See you next time.